Hi, I'm Andy, your digital host at Hubbard United Methodist Church. We know your week can get busy, so whether you missed us on Sunday, are just joining us for the first time, or just want to watch the sermon again, welcome. We're glad you're here. If you're new, the Hubbard will include about 20 to 30 minutes of the most important part of Sunday's sermon. Thanks for joining us, and welcome to church. <laughs> I'm Ed Poitras, and I'll be your liturgist today. In today's scripture readings, we hear God's word in different ways. Psalm 29 describes God's voice as a mighty wind. In Mark's gospel, as Jesus rises from the waters of the River Jordan, he hears God speak words of blessing. At the start of each Pentecostal season, we begin anew. As we celebrate the baptism of the Lord, we discover new beginnings, for God is always at work, 
creating new blessings. Hear God's voice in Psalm 29. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord over mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of, cedars of Lebanon. He makes the Lebanon skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord causes the oaks to whirl and strips the forest bare. And in the temple all say, Glory! The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. And in Mark's gospel, we hear these words. So John the baptizer, baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And the whole Judean region and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the strap of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of his word. Amen. Roots. They anchor us, nourish us, and are essential for growth. In every journey of faith, it's the roots that provide stability, guiding our path forward. As we delve into the deep roots of the Methodist movement, we find more than traditions. We uncover the vibrant tapestry of our faith, woven through time by God's Spirit. Personal and social holiness, holy conferencing, grace, the sacraments. These roots are not just remnants of the past. They are living, breathing testimonies of God's enduring presence, shaping us, guiding us. Together, let's discover how they empower us, inspire our future, and breathe life into our journey today. So I remember when I had the opportunity to do my very first baptism as a pastor. And it was actually between the time that I actually became licensed and the day that I actually started at my first church. And so I was doubly blessed that day in that I was able to baptize two people at the same time, Grace and Lily Garfield. Now, Grace was the mom, and Lily was her eight-year-old daughter. 
And because I hadn't quite started at the church yet, uh, my first actual baptisms were, were held at the Garfield home. And they had a pool and a hot tub. And so my very first baptisms, they weren't done in the hot tub. They were done in a pool. And so when I think about baptism, I often think about being in a pool. Or every time I'm at a pool, I kind of think about my first baptism. So it's kind of pretty great. But uh, the question I have uh, that I'd like to ask us today, as we consider today anyway, uh, I would like you to reflect on the baptisms that you have experienced in worship. You know, what were they like? What words or memories come to mind? I mean, these bapti uh, baptisms that maybe you yourself have participated in or that you've witnessed, uh, were these expectations perceived as sort of a momentary action or were they beginning a lifelong process? So when you think of the baptisms that you've witnessed here or maybe some other place, uh, what are the words that come to mind? And you know what? You can say those out loud. What are words that come to mind when you think of baptism? Excitement? I'm sorry? River Jordan. Holy Spirit. Family. Love. Yes. You know, there's a lot of words, right? I mean, throughout history and time, depending on the tradition that you grew up in, whether you're Methodist or Baptist or Lutheran or Catholic or Orthodox, you know, maybe it was a non-denominational church or maybe you had no church growing up. You know, whatever your faith tradition or your faith background is, there's been a lot that's been said about baptism and what it means, right? But hopefully, every baptism that you have witnessed and have been a part of has captured a holy moment in the life of that person, whether they're a child or whether they were all grown up, and that they haven't been just some routine action, you know, that happens in worship with just a few words and a little bit of water, and it's done, right? Because we understand, as a people of faith, a tradition, a faith tradition, that baptism is foundational. And as United Methodists, it's one of the roots that grounds us in all that we do and all that we are as a people of faith. And in the United Methodist Church, people of all ages are baptized, including babies. And, and in baptizing babies, it's just one practice that shows our belief in, in provenient grace. And that's God's grace that's present before we are even aware of it. And because we don't have to wait until we're all grown up, right? I, I mean, we don't have to wait. We know that God is pouring down his love from the very beginning, that God loves us from the very first time we hear our morning cry all the way to the very end when we take our last breath and even beyond into the next life. You know, God's love is available to all of us, and it's always there. It's a lifelong process of salvation, including God's initiating activity of grace, as well as a willing human response. So most of you, many of you know that I am a recent graduate of Kairos University out of Sioux Falls, and part of my degree had to do with something called history. And which meant that I had a combination of the history of Christianity as a whole, including the political, the scientific, the Old Testament, New Testament history, as well as denominational history. So I kind of like uh, little tidbits of historical fact. And so I thought I would see if you remembered this historical fact. Now, back in April of 1985, it was announced on worldwide news that the Coca-Cola company was doing something new. Anybody remember? Oh, well, some of you, some of you might remember they were taking the original Coke off the shelves and replacing it with something they called New Coke. And I, I don't know, how many of you tried the new Coke and liked it? Ooh, you liked it. 
you raised your hand too soon, didn't you? You try. <laughs> you know, it wasn't like the new Coke was going to be uh, on the shelves right next to that original Coke. I mean, if it had been, it might not have been such a fiasco, right? <laughs> Instead, what they did was they took all the original recipe off the shelves completely and replaced it with the new Coke. Now, I'm certain that before they did that, they had a lot of focus groups, and they surveyed hundreds of people, and they did a lot of research, and they tried to figure out, you know, what the best formula was, and we're going to try and do this, and it's going to be great, and it's going to be a wonderful thing. But it ended up being one of the most egregious errors ever in the food and beverage industry, because people had a problem with the new Coke. And so the stock of Coke began to plummet. And all the celebrities who were on those commercials and advertising promoting this new Coke started seeing a devastating effect on their careers. And so people started fleeing Coke by the, the brand by the millions. And the executives uh, of Coke finally announced on July 11th of 1985, just three months after they introduced this new Coke, that they were pulling the new Coke off the shelves and replacing it with the original recipe once again. And this is a quote from the CEO of Coke at that time. And he said, this is the simple fact. The fact is that all the time and the money and the skill that we poured into consumer research of this new Coke couldn't measure up or reveal the deep and abiding emotional attachment to the original Coke, felt by so many people. Now, I, you're wondering why I'm sharing this. I'm sharing this with all of you today because I feel like within the church, the church's history, every now and again, there are people like these Coke executives who want to mess with the original recipe that God gave us in the Holy Scriptures about how we are to live into community with one another. There are people who want to mess with how we do church and what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ and what it means to be a faithful person living out our call. And every now and again, within the church's history, there are people who want to change the way we do things. And our brand, if you will, becomes tainted. And people begin to flee the church. And it's no surprise to us that our particular denomination even has been in decline, you know, every denomination, ever since 1968. And there are those who look around the sanctuary today and say, oh, these pews used to be so full. They were overflowing and back into the fellowship hall and when pastor so-and-so was here. And, you know, uh, we just need to find somebody like Pastor So-and-so, and the pews will be filled all once again. Well, friends, I have to say to you, I'm sorry. <laughs> but the world has changed, and, and things have changed, and people have been fleeing. And in our particular time in history, right, Right now, even, even our United Methodist denomination, you know, it has gone through this time of turmoil and dissension, though I honestly believe we are coming back stronger than ever. I mean, I'm looking out here today. It's awesome. In fact, someone mentioned to me this week that they were looking at a couple of different websites of churches in our area, and they were praising us for our website, though I do admit we do need to update our website a little bit more, and we're working on that, um, and more often. But, but they praised us because on the front page of our website, we list our mission statement, that we are a church where love dwells and faith grows and mission leads, and meaning that we're a church that believes in loving God and loving others, and that we proclaim that boldly and without apology. We proclaim that we're a church whose doors are open to all ages and nations and races and that we follow that baptismal covenant of opening our doors and reaffirming the value and worth of every individual. The other website they reviewed 
had difficulty at best um, articulating their mission. In fact, I looked it up, and the mission statement on the site said, coming soon. And, and the person that was sharing that with me shared that as an outsider looking at these two websites, what they saw was Hubbard United Methodist Church is a church that knows who we are, that we are following our calling as children of God to love God with all our heart and mind and soul and strength and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And the sister church is a church that right now is uncertain about their identity and, and uh, who they are as, as a church and a congregation. And this person said to me, which church would you want to walk into? A church that hasn't any idea or vision for themselves or a church that knows who they are and wants to proclaim the love and the light of Christ everywhere they go. So on the second Sunday of the season of Pentecost, we are remembering that Jesus came, friends, not just for the Jews, but for all people, uh, for the Gentiles as well. And today we remember the baptism of Christ when Christ's identity was claimed and named. And, and, he, and he, we remember this baptism and he heard the heavens open up and say, you are my son and with you I am well pleased. You know, when Jesus came to identify with each and every one of us and to remind us that when we enter those waters of baptism, we die with Christ and we are raised with Christ and we hear that same voice from God saying, with you, I am well pleased. You are beloved. This is your identity. In the baptismal waters, Jesus' true identity is revealed to us and made manifest to us. And in the baptismal waters, we are reminded of our true identity as children of God. You know, Robert Frost, the poet, has said, home is the place that when you go there, they have to take you in. And Jesus has said that the church, the community of faith, is our true home. And here at Hubbard, we are a community of faith that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, we will take you in. For we are all God's children. You know, a certain pastor in a small Midwest town tells of a time when a nondescript woman came to worship and she sat in the very back corner of the church. And he noticed her during the worship service, through the whole service. And after the service, she came up to him and she said, Pastor, I would like you to baptize my new grandson. And the pastor said, well, I'd be happy to. I'm going to need to speak with the child's parents. And would you, you know, why don't you just have him give me a call? And the woman said, well, the child's mom is my 18-year-old daughter. And we have no idea where to find the father of this child. Well, in that small town, all of the townspeople knew exactly what they thought of this teenage daughter. And they had their own opinions about the father who left town and when he found out that that child was going to be born. And they also had their opinions about the 18-year-old's parents and grandparents. And the people were going around calling that child illegitimate. And the pastor said that he just wanted to scream every single time he heard that word. For he said, no child is illegitimate. All are God's children. So despite the fears of what the townspeople might say, the pastor told the grandmother, yes, I will baptize your grandson. And on this Sunday, when the young mother came in and her baby and her grandmother, and the pastor asked them the question that he always asked in that little church, whenever there was a baptism, he asked, who will stand with this child? And at first, the only person to stand with the mom and the baby was the grandmother. So the pastor was about to continue with this baptismal service when all of a sudden the most respected older man in the congregation stood up and followed by his wife. And shortly after that, the Sunday school teacher stood up and then another and then another. And within minutes, the entire congregation was standing with that little baby, that 18-year-old mother and that grandmother. They were living out, the pastor said, the scripture that he had shared with them that day. 
those familiar words that say beloved. Let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. The pastor said, in that baptism service that day, those words came alive. Those words were clothed in the flesh of those people. And everybody in the community knew it. My friends, when such love happens, it happens when we remember our baptism. When we remember who we are, we, when we remember that every single one of us is named and claimed by God and that we belong to God in love. And when we let God win our hearts, we are called to live in such a way that we don't allow other hearts to be broken. And that brings me to something else I just want to mention today. As I go through this sermon series on rediscovering our roots, I want to touch on the essential parts of what it means to follow Christ. I mean, I think back over the history of the church, and I realize that so often when we've gone astray, we have forgotten that love is the essential of the church. Back in the 1700s, there was a gentleman who thought we ought to go back to that original recipe that Christ built for the church, being built on that foundation of love, being built on a foundation of fellowship with one another. And he realized that the church had strayed and that the church had become about a building and about a hierarchy, and about rules, and about following those rules. And so this young man named John Wesley, who was a fellow and a student at Oxford University, said, this is absurd. We need to love people where they are. We need to have communion and fellowship with one another. And he became very methodical on how he went about to following this recipe of being a follower of Christ. He was so methodical that his critics called him a Methodist. And he never intended to start the denomination. I mean, he simply want, wanted the church to be a church that Christ had called it to be. He wanted us to live by our baptismal covenant. He wanted us to live in fellowship and communion with God and with one another. And the leaders of the church said to Wesley, you can't do that. And he said, do what? They said, you can't go out to the mines and preach to the miners out there. They need to come into the church. And Wesley said, but for so many reasons, they can't come into the church. So I'm going out to where they are and to share the good news of Christ with them. And I'm going to go out and tell them that all their past failures have been forgiven by Christ and that they could start fresh, they can start anew, and that they are valued and that they are loved simply because of who they are. And the leaders of the church said to Wesley, but you can't do that. And he said, but there are people in the new world who need communion taken to them. They, they need to experience the sacrament of love and forgiveness like we're going to celebrate next week here. And the leaders of the church said, but there's no one who's ordained to do that, who's qualified. No one has the qualifications to serve communion to the people in the new world. And Wesley said, I'll have lay people do it. I will consecrate the elements and send them through them. Communion needs to be shared. The table of Christ is wide. It's open to all people. And Wesley wanted to emphasize love over power, love over everything else. He wanted to emphasize a fellowship. And so he said, we're going to go to the hospitals where people are hurting and need to hear the good news of God's love and care for them. And so the Methodist Church throughout the years has built many hospitals. Wesley said, we need to go into the prisons. And Jesus said, when I was imprisoned, you visited me. We need to go where the people are and remind them, remind them of the essentials of life, of loving God and loving neighbor as themselves. Wesley said, we're going to educate rather than indoctrinate. And we're going to love because we're going to care. And we're going to go right down the middle because, you know, when you go to the extremes, you pull away from that central message of the gospel. He understood balance in life. And he understood that Christianity is both personal and social. 
And it's about me and Jesus and my relationship with Christ. But it's also about sharing and doing the work, resisting evil in whatever forms they present themselves, as our baptismal covenant reminds us. We've got to love the world the way Jesus loves us. We've got to reach out with hope and help and healing. And there's a tension, friends, in that. But it's this tension that we're called to live into. A tension of sharing with others the importance of following the way of love. The doctrine of love in all that we do. You know, there was a young girl a member of a much beloved, and she was a member of a British Methodist church, and she was six years old, and she was in a nativity play. And she had a little minor role. She played the angel in that play. And she was the one who had to utter the line, Behold, I bring, I bring you glad tidings of great joy. And she rehearsed that line over and over again. Behold, I bring you glad tidings of great joy. But on the night of the performance, when she stood before that crowd of people, she became a little nervous. And instead of reciting the line as perfectly as she had rehearsed it for so many weeks before her family, she froze. And suddenly she blurted out, behave! I bring you glad tidings of great joy. You know, friends, I think so often... The church has strayed from the original recipe, and we have preached a gospel of behave. I bring you glad tidings of great joy. And the message is not behave before you receive grace and love, my friends. The message is you are loved because God, you're God's child. You are loved and forgiven, and you are called to live a life of love and joy and help and hope and healing and bring that good news to others. Baptism is not about us being worthy before God. It's God great, God's grace given to us. It's a gift to us. In baptism, God's spirit is at work in our life just as that dove descended on Jesus. We too receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, God with us to help us to do the things and to be the people that God is calling us to be. You are all named and claimed and precious in God's eyes as God's creation. Please don't let others tell us what it means to follow Christ. You know, listen to the words of God. Listen to the words of Christ. Remember your baptisms. You don't have to remember it physically, but remember that you are baptized in Christ's name. And, and when I was a student in my first years of seminary, my homiletics professor, our preaching professor, loved to remind us that we are people who are walking wet. Wet with the waters of baptism. And we need to be reminded of that over and over again. We have, to, we have the power of the Holy Spirit within us to do the work that God has called us to do, to do the work of justice and mercy and love in this world, and to remember that we are named and claimed as children of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, friends, as we go out into the world, let every time you see water or pass water or drink water or touch water, remember that you are named and claimed and beloved by God. Go forth in the assurance that God goes with you as you are called to be a light to others in the name of our holy God, of Jesus the Son, and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Amen. I'm going to invite Jenny. Thanks for joining us for The Hub Word. If you want more content like this, you can go ahead and click our profile down below and then go to our YouTube video page. That's where the rest of The Hub Words will be and you can watch those there. Also make sure to check us out on social medias like Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok by searching Hubbard UMC or Hubbard United Methodist Church. That's all from us. Have a great week.